Greetings, greenhouse people, and welcome to another episode of Tech On Demand, brought to you by Grower Talks. I'm your host, Bill Calkins, and our goal here is to help you grow your best crop ever by sharing cultural and technical information based on discussions with experts around the globe. Although sometimes we'll cover other topics in the horticulture realm like nursery and retail. This time we're joined by Aaron Palmatier, Senior Technical Service Representative with Bayer Ornamentals to talk about managing insects on poinsettias. Aaron brings extensive experience solving problems and providing pest and disease management recommendations for ornamental producers and landscape professionals. Aaron's a former ornamental specialist at the University of Florida and received his doctorate in plant pathology from Auburn University and his master's and bachelor's degrees in plant and soil science from Southern Illinois University in Carbondale. You'll want to stick around to the end of this podcast to learn more about a new resource from Bayer, a Spanish-language pest ID guide that promises to be a must-have at all greenhouses. Okay, let's get going. Insects and poinsettias. Welcome, I'm Bill Calkins. I'm the senior editor for Grower Talks and Green Profit Magazine, and I'm excited to be joined by Aaron Palmatier with Bayer, who's going to be our guest for a series of podcasts covering a range of topics related to pest and disease control on greenhouse and ornamental crops. This episode will focus on insects and poinsettias, which unfortunately always seem to go hand in hand. So Aaron, welcome to the podcast. Hey, thank you, Bill. It's great to be here. So to get started, Aaron, can you tell the listeners a little bit about your background and why you're here to focus on insects and poinsettias? Yeah, ab- absolutely. So, so I'm, I'm a, a tech support specialist for Bear's ornamental business, uh, and I've been in that role uh, with Bear, let's say, just over, you know, almost three and a half years now. Uh, but my previous life, um, I was on faculty uh, at the University of Florida in the Department of Plant Pathology, and um, I was actually uh, located at the Tropical Research and Education Center, which is down in, in South Florida, about 30 miles south of Miami, so about as far down south as you can go. And um, I had a, an extension and a research appointment there. And but one of my roles was uh, covering uh, the diagnostic clinic. So, so for, gosh, just uh, near 13 years, um, I, I had responsibility over a diagnostic clinic. So uh, as you might imagine, in a nearly tropical environment where they have production year round, and it's a big ornamental producing area. Uh, I've, I've just about seen it all <laughs> from, you know, from a standpoint of, of both pests and diseases and, and, and also disorders. Um, and then so, you know, with, with working with ornamentals uh, and, and bear, uh, you know, as, as an extension support specialist, uh, I, I really am just like an extension specialist, like you'd see in a university setting, uh, and, and except in this case, I, I travel all over the U.S. Uh, working with both greenhouse and, and nursery growers. And, and you know, poinsettias, uh, for one, is, you know, that's a, that's a pretty big deal in, in, in the ornamental industry. And, and so I'm always happy to talk about uh, pest and, uh, issues on poinsettias. And, um, and today I think we're going to talk about some insects. Excellent. Excellent. And I know, uh, as I said in your, your, your bio before the podcast and uh, look, looking over some of the, the, uh, the different places you've been, you've, you've been at Auburn, um, you've been at Southern Illinois. So I think that, that probably gives you a pretty good perspective on uh, the regionality of pests and diseases and disorders, um, which is always uh, great to talk to someone who has a, a knowledge of different regions across the United States. And, uh, you know, you spend a, quite a bit of time in, in the South, but also I'm sure you have a somewhat of a Midwestern perspective on pests and diseases as well. 
Yeah, Bill, that's funny you mentioned that because I'm I started just outside of Chicago, um, and and then like you said, I I got my my bachelor's, my master's at Southern Illinois. I got my PhD at Auburn, and I I slowly gravitated south. And you know, uh, it, it and again, you know, South Florida uh, from a, you know being a plant pathologist, it's just it's a mecca for <laughs> for for disease issues. So everything you, everything you learn in a textbook, uh, you can see firsthand. Uh, living in South Florida. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, your credentials are definitely impressive, and uh, and certainly your work your work with Bayer over the past few years um, has I'm sure you've encountered all sorts of greenhouse challenges, and um, including poinsettias, which we're going to dig into today. Um, clearly, a critical crop for our industry. Um, you know, a seasonal crop, but a big seasonal crop. So. Uh, when it comes to insect identification, prevention, and control, it's something that I think uh, all growers are, are pretty keen on. So real quick, if, in, if the listeners are interested in talking to you or the folks at Bayer about diagnosing their problems, how can they do that? I know that your whole team has been experimenting, you know, pun completely intended on experiments with some of these new ways to connect as well as some traditional ways. And maybe once you've shared these resources, I think you want to talk a little bit about the importance of diagnostics as well. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. So, so one, you know, we, here we are, uh, you know, recording a podcast and I mean, it, which is a great resource uh, for, for growers to obtain information. And when it comes to, you know, contacting myself or anyone within the ornamental business at, at Bear. Uh, you know the the website es dot bear dot us is it will bring you to a page where you can get contact information uh, for for all the players within within the ornamentals uh, business. But um, the other thing is you know the the everybody's got a cell phone of course. So so you know pick up the cell phone. Uh, you can you can talk things through via via the phone. But then if you're using an iPhone per se, you can actually do FaceTime. I've had uh, growers contact me on FaceTime and take me through their greenhouse uh, works really well. Uh, for those who, who aren't using an iPhone, they would have an Android or other, um, you know, Microsoft Teams. Uh, we've used that a lot. Uh, it's, it's a great uh, uh, format for, for interacting. And, and the same as can be said for Zoom. Uh, you know, there's all these different um, virtual uh, resources or, or methods for, for communication. So, I mean, it's a Today, it's just unbelievable how you can, you know, you can really get a lot done um, uh, remotely. And so all great tools. Um, and and I'm, I make myself readily available, um, you know, so, so don't hesitate to, to reach out with, uh, you know, texting or shooting emails with photos or we can eventually evolve into a, a virtual uh, conversation or, um, or meeting, if you will. And then, you know, the other thing you mentioned, Bill, is uh, diagnostics or, um, you know, one of the things, and even, even talking about insects, or let's just step back and, and talk about poinsettia production and the importance of, of knowing what you're dealing with. You know, I, I tell people all the time, uh, you can talk to plants, but they, they don't talk back. You know, you know, some growers will tell you the plants talk to them, and I understand that if they've been they've been in the business a long time because they 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 know they, they know these plants uh, inside and out. Um, but but the you know you're dealing with a silent patient, and so you know it's really important um, when it comes to the big picture and in managing or even implementing an integrated pest management program you know the uh identifying the problem is definitely the the first step uh because you you want you, you want to make informed decisions you just don't want to shoot from the hip um you know if you're just out there spraying chemicals uh, you may be spraying the wrong type of chemical uh, without knowing what you're up against. Uh, you know, you're, you're, you're wasting time, potential money, and, you know, it's not good for the environment. So that's kind of my, my, my biggest plug, uh, being a plant pathologist and also having that diagnostic background. Uh, that's just fundamental. Identify what's going on. Um, and, you know, there's, there's a lot of resources out there to assist with that process. I mean, I, I'm just one of, of many, 
Uh, but you know, you've got your university extension uh, contacts. You've you've got the the industry contacts. So you know, a lot of the a lot of the, the larger companies uh, such as Bear have a lot of resources in house that that would be made available to you. Um, and then you know, then there's there's also private consultants. Um, you know, so there's there's a lot of uh, access, I guess, to expertise, if you will, to assist. But it's it's important to take that time, and and really try to to get the problem identified and and then control. And then the good thing is, is if if you do get it properly identified, uh, you'll know or you'll be, you should be able to recognize it. Um, much quicker and, and control it before it becomes a problem in the future. That's awesome. It's, there are a lot of experts standing by, but what you said about knowing what you're dealing with and, and the silent patient analogy, I think is quite important for everybody to remember. Um, you've got experts standing by at Bayer and at the universities. And so don't, uh, don't be afraid to reach out and ask for help. Um, because if you can identify the problem, then as you said, you can start to make the, the right decisions uh, moving forward. They're going to not only most likely save you some money, but also uh, solve the problem and, and, and save your crop. So uh, I think that's uh, really good information to share. Um, what, are, what are some of the main challenges uh, that, that U.S. growers face with point set of production since we're going to dive right into the topic at hand? And I think it's important, as we mentioned a little bit earlier, the regionally specific concerns and sort of understanding your crop in, in your own setting. Um, and maybe touch on insects, but feel free to broaden the scope as you see fit. We're going to really spend a lot of time uh, this episode talking about insects. So um, sure, talk sure. a little bit about what, uh, what some of the main challenges these growers are facing with poinsettia. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I think it all starts with, uh, with the source, you know, first off, you know, with, you know, if you're, if you're getting uh, plugs or if you're getting rooted liners, um, you know, for one, it's the, the quality of the product that you're getting, the state of that product and, and you know, the potential for it to be harboring in any pest right out of the chute. I mean, you open a box up and you got black, black flies that come flying out of there, uh, or, or, or even, even white flies for that matter. Um, you know, that's, that's an issue from, from the start. So for, for one is identifying quality, uh, clean source, uh, for propagation material. The, the other thing I, I will mention is, you know, the, uh, uh, with is shipping, this this material one of the things that can often happen uh is that the plants get stuck in in places get delayed uh and what happens of course uh you know in most of the time you know for propagation during poinsettia season it's going to be heat related stress uh you know but but there's there's stress that comes with that with uh, with shipment issues and um if you're starting with stressed uh, plants from the beginning, uh, that's just that's just a, a greater challenge, um, you know, because when when the plant is stressed out, it's predisposed, and you know, both both pests, insect pests, and also uh, pathogens, uh, you know, can can easily compromise that stressed uh, uh, tissue. So that, that's, you know, the first thing I, I think that kind of can, can haunt everybody across the board uh, with, you know, major, you know, when you talk about major challenges, um, I think that's, you know, that's one. Uh, the, the other thing that can happen, like I, I mentioned last year, I heard of a number of growers that we're dealing with uh, what was potentially resistance, uh, you know, white fly resistance in, um, in some poinsettia crops. When I say resistance, meaning resistant to, to insecticides. And that's, that's another issue. If you, you know, if you're getting a, a, I guess, uh, a, a biotype of, of, of an insect, such as a white fly, that uh, that's overcome uh, some chemistry that you're using in in your in in, in your production system, uh, that can definitely be a challenge. Uh, and then you know when you talk about regional issues, so so what what happens is the, the just the overall uh, environmental conditions. You know, of course, greenhouse 
as a greenhouse. Uh, there may be some, you know, some degree, but but there's also poinsettias that are being grown uh, under, you know, under different conditions. Like in South Florida, you know, they have uh, essentially they have shade shade type structures, or they're 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 more or less open. Uh, structures where they just have plastic roofs in some cases, but they're just wide open and they're essentially outside. Uh, and there's a lot of poinsettia that's produced under those conditions. Um, and then you've got the complete reverse where you've got really, really high infrastructure type uh, greenhouse uh, with concrete floors and everything. But the so so the environmental conditions can vary even even in a greenhouse, um, or I should say also just the potential for insects and pests. To get into that, that that greenhouse structure can vary uh, from a from a regional perspective, and I'll just you know one one big one from from an insect standpoint uh, is that in in Florida, speaking firsthand for South Florida, mealybug pressure is just off the chart. It seems that mealy, mealybugs have just gotten more and more uh, common and and challenging. Um, and so, uh, Florida growers are, are, are definitely battling mealybugs. And of course, other growers w will have mealybugs uh, and they can blame Florida growers <laughs> for <laughs> shipping them to them. But, but the bottom line is, is that's, that's a classic example of a pest on poinsettia that, uh, that you know, uh, Bob's Greenhouse in, in Massachusetts may not see any mealybug on poinsettia or they've never seen it before and they don't have it. And so that's just a classic example of, of where you're, where you're located. And then, you know, in, in areas where you've got environmental conditions, maybe it's a little drier um, and, and less humidity, you may have, you know, you may have more mite pressure under those conditions. And so, so definitely, um, you know, there, to some degree, there, there's differences, but, but, you know, uh, it seems, you know, because we're all growing poinsettia, speaking of poinsettias, you know, you, you do have that you, you can all kind of, uh, uh, play by the by the same rule book if you will you know because because you've got the host in common mm -hmm. um yeah and and, and i'll talk uh more about because i think the really uh the regional differences uh for diseases that can that can have a, a pretty big pretty big impact um there are some diseases of poinsettia that, that you don't see across the board that's that's for sure um and so but that's you know that's kind of the you know, the, I, I think the again, you got to you got to account for the challenges in 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 your area for for, for what you're up against, and again, uh, what's coming in on those plants. That's that's a that's a big factor for sure. That makes a lot of sense, and um, you will have some some unique insect situations in different regions. Um, there are obviously the the key the key poinsettia insects that you're going to talk uh, about here in a little bit that that most growers uh, have to deal with or have dealt with in the past. And, and your advice about starting with a clean source is, is very critical. Um, I know that, you know, just in, in producing any crop, you need to start strong. And if you don't, you're uh, kind of behind the eight ball already. So, but also like in, in all aspects of greenhouse production, insects pressures can change from year to year. So can you talk about some of the issues that growers could be facing this year, um, but maybe in, in, in reference to past years, what you've seen, I know that um, for 2020, it's fairly early in the point set of season, but you know, I don't, I don't know if you have a crystal ball handy, if you can predict any issues that growers should be prepared for um, ahead of time. <laughs> so uh, I don't know, let, let, why don't you let the listeners know a little bit about what, what you've seen here early on, what you've seen in the past couple of years and uh, some of the, the challenges you think growers should be ready for yeah sure sure that's uh you know the crystal ball thing yeah it's it's always first it's never a dull moment mm -hmm. um you're you're always uh up for for something new or challenging that's that's for certain you know um i just i know from you know la last year uh you know the white flies are always a always a big issue um, and I, I know that there was uh, quite a few, uh, you know, just uh, cases where where the white flies just seem to be relentless. And so I, I think that you know, looking forward, I think white flies are going to be a big deal 
um, again this year. And it just seems that that's, uh, you know, they're just, uh, they love poinsettia. We grow, uh, uh, we as, a, as, as an industry grow it. Uh, we're looking at probably a big year uh, based on uh, the communication I've had with growers. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot of poinsettias going in. Um, the, you know, the, again, I, I, I mentioned the, you know, stress through the shipping and we're, we're seeing that right out of the shoot this year, uh, you know, hearing about, um, you know, issues, uh, with, with deliveries being delayed and, and that's a, that's a big problem. Um, you know, you, you get plants sitting, uh, they're, you know, they're, they're getting stressed out, especially with, with the heat stress and, and you know, so so one of the things, of course, if they're they're wet and they're hot, that's a that's just uh, man, that's a great recipe for some disease issues. Um, but you know, if you've if you've got uh, you know the potential with wetness for fungus fungus gnat um, uh, can be a big problem, the larvae especially. And so you know, the again the the, the stress um, associated uh, with with the shipping, um, I think you know that's something that's kind of haunting us off out of the shoot. And I think the other thing again is going to be um, making sure that we're geared up to handle these these white fly populations, um, and especially you know these these uh, the med. Uh, type white fly, which is the you know the biotypes that are resistant to neonics, and they're also uh, in case in many cases resistant to insect growth regulators. And so when you when you're dealing with uh, when, you know with a pest that that uh, a lot of your tools don't work, uh, that can be a, a real challenge. So you need to you really need to be prepared to have a number of different insecticides. I see different meaning uh, different based on the mode of action. So like your, your insect uh, resistance action committee, that IRAC group, you want to have several, uh, you know, products on hand that are going to be effective on controlling white flies. And then of course, you're going to, you're going to want, you're going to want to rotate and you, you may, may be prepared to see where something's not working like it did last year. And that's when you need to try something uh, new and different. So you've talked about potential for relentless white flies. I like that, uh, that adjective, cause they certainly can be relentless. Um, some other challenges that, that you're going to see because of some stresses in shipping, you mentioned fungus gnats, uh, you mentioned uh, mites, um, and then you talked a little bit about the importance of uh, understanding your rotation and the modes of action of the different chemicals. I think that those are all uh, very critical. Um, I don't know if, uh, if you want to go into any more detail on those or if you want to start talking about solutions, because really, you know, once you've identified the problem, once you've, you know, you've scouted and found these insects, uh, pests in your greenhouse. Um, I know that uh, uh, Bayer has some has some solutions uh, in the toolbox to help help growers uh, uh, get over these problems and keep those crops growing strong. So I don't know if you wanted to go into any more detail on the insects or if you want to shift over to some of the solutions and how growers can start employing these different chemicals in their greenhouses uh, in rotation. Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, the only the only other thing I'll, I'll mention about about insects because I I, I you know, see this from time to time is you know you like you just uh, I think repeated I've mentioned you know the, the fungus gnats the shore flies uh, issues in propagation with it, you know excessive wetness I, I mean everybody's had their their fair <laughs> their fair share with with fungus gnats and 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 shore flies and and but the the other one uh, that I've seen that can come in it's it's not really you know, well documented, or I should say well documented, it's just not one of the, the scream out like white fly scream out when you're talking about poinsettias, but thrips, thrips can def be a definite issue. And I mean, you know, thrips, of course, are, I mean, they're, they're just, uh, everybody talks about thrips, but, but on poinsettia, um, you, you can get thrips uh, problems. And, and a lot of times they're coming off of those, the, you know, other bedding plants or, or the, uh, you know, your, your mum crop, especially, uh, they can bounce off of those and go on to to the poinsettia. So that's another one you got to look you got to look out for. And one of the things that that I've I've noticed, you know, because some growers they don't really think thrips when they're talking about 
uh, poinsettias. But you know, those thrips will primarily attack your youngest leaves. They can cause distorted growth. Uh, a lot of times, like this white scarring on the leaves, and I've seen you know cases where they're mistaking it for you know, environmental stress, uh, nutritional deficiencies is another one. Um, and and you know, just because they're not on, not not looking for for thrips, so definitely. Uh, you know, if you're growing, uh, especially if you've got uh, crops, um, you know, like, like uh, some, you know, some of the, of course, uh, you know, the uh, mums in particular, you know, they're, they're going to attract thrips and then the thrips are going to move on and, and potentially uh, cause problems on the poinsettia. But, but that's, uh, you know, that's another one in, in, in addition to the, to the mites um, that, uh, you know, can, can definitely uh, cause problems. But when it, when it comes to solutions, uh, Bill, uh, one of the big things, of course, is the, uh, you know, the, a lot of the growers, especially those that are growing for the big box stores um, over, over the past couple of years have been really limited uh, with not being able to use neonicotinoids. Um, and that's, that's been a challenge. And, and one of the things that's, uh, you know, I'm, I'm happy to, I guess, be the messenger on behalf of Bayer is that you know, we've got um, three uh, insecticide solutions uh, for poinsettias that, that are non-neonicotinoids. Uh, and uh, uh, more, more importantly, I shouldn't really say more importantly, but, but I guess it's a, a really strong care, uh, uh, quality or benefit. It's two of those are, are systemic. And so there's not too many uh chemistries out there that are systemic and not neonics and so so the two you know altus being one um it's a you know it, it's a great product for piercing sucking insects so when you know definitely when you're talking about poinsettias uh the white flies are a big one it's it's a it's a really good product uh for for white flies and the nice thing is you can you can drench with altus or you can use it as a foliar spray, um, and so uh, that's that's always a, a nice thing. We've 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 screened it on um, tons of poinsettia varieties uh, in color, uh, have not had any issues uh, from a plant safety standpoint. And then the other one, which is is probably one of my all time favorites uh, when you talk about insecticides, is is Contos and. Um, Contos is, is very unique because it, it like Altus, it's systemic, uh, but this one is actually both um, uh, xylem and phloem systemic. So if, if I'm not mistaken, it's one of the only insecticides that actually can move downward in the phloem of the plant. So, so for example, you spray contos, uh, it will move down and actually protect the roots from such things as like uh, root aphids or root mealybugs. Um, but then you can turn around and drench with it. It'll move up into the canopy uh, and protect, uh, you know, protect the entire plant. So pr pretty, pretty cool stuff. And contos is also labeled uh, for your piercing sucking insects like such as white flies however contos um, also has activity and i should mention uh, altus is also active on thrips but contos has activity on thrips but the the really cool thing is is contos um it will control mites um and and so you've got something that's systemic that has activity on mites but the key to using contos uh is it's all about preventative applications because if you've got mites and you treat with contos you're not going to be happy it's it's slow but if you've got a clean plant and you're you're treating with contos you're going to reduce and control your thrips your mites um, and and your white flies so um, again two two great systemic products and then the the third one that we have for insects on poinsettias is, is savat um, and savant uh, is is not systemic, uh, but it's it's labeled for sprays, and it's got tremendous translaminar activity. And and savant is one um, where I mentioned contos being used preventatively. Altus really needs to be used, you know, preventatively for for the best 
uh, um, I guess, experience or the best control. And then with Savant, uh, it actually has knockdown activity. And Savant targets mites. It's an it's a insecticide, miticide, but it targets mites and white flies. Um, and it's also um, safe to use on, on poinsettias. And so where, where I've seen Savant work really well um, is when you've got uh, fly-ins like white flies, fly in uh, late season you can go in with an application and just knock those down um, and then when it comes to mites you know savat uh, it actually controls all life stages but it, it controls uh, not only your two spotted spider mites but your cyclamen mites and also your lewis mites which have, have all been popping up on poinsettias so yeah, so we we've got some some really uh, I think some some excellent solutions uh, that that growers can use, and and I can um, I'd be happy to uh, you know talk more about how how best to, to fit those into uh, into a uh, a pest management uh, program. But we we actually have resources on the website that can show growers how to to best use those products in in poinsettia production. That's great. And I, I think that when, when growers look at their overall regimes and they uh, need to know how to fit some of these uh, new technologies in, um, that, it's, that it's really cool that you guys have those kind of resources. And I would encourage the listeners, reach out to Aaron and the folks at Bayer. Um, they will help you uh, develop the, the most effective rotation using uh, the products that, that you have and, uh, and knowing the, the crops that you're that you're working on. And to me, this is exciting because I love the new technology in our industry. And I think this, you know, fits, fits right in. You've got uh, systemic options, you've got translaminar options, um, you've got preventative options and treatments uh, for when, when you see the problem, you know, right in front of you. So um, definitely a big shout out to Bayer for uh, coming, coming to the table with some non uh, neo Nick solutions. Uh, Cause I know a lot of growers have that on their minds. So um, I really do uh, appreciate all this information. Thank you so much for all the time that, that you took walking us through the challenges that growers are seeing um, and especially the solutions. Do you have anything to add before we close here, Aaron? Yeah, you know, I guess, you know, one thing I, I will, I, I'd like to just end on, I think, uh, Bill, is, you know, with my transition coming from, you know, working in the university setting, uh, you know, with my you know, lengthy academic background and then being a, an, an extension specialist for so many years and then coming into to working for a, for a company uh, like Bear, uh, one of the things that you learn, uh, you know, is, is to really uh, hone in on is, is cost in use. And I just want to, I, I think it's important for growers to, to not, do not get caught up with the sticker shock uh, of the price of a product. Look at what, you know, the value that it brings to your operation. So, you know, if you, if you do the math and you figure out, you know, you know, what rates you're going to be using at, how frequently you're going to be applying it, but then also, of course, the, the efficacy that it brings and the control that it brings, it, you know, it's, it's, it's too often you see, which rightfully so, you know, you're struggling because you want to stay as better um, and, and, you know, using products that, that are, are proven and effective uh, goes, goes a long way and can, can definitely uh, save a lot of time and frustration in, in the long run. So, so do, you know, due diligence, um, look at the, look at the cost in use um, and uh, that can, that can always, uh, you know, it can, 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 can make you a, a winner in the long run. <laughs> Absolutely. And I like the way what you said, sort of the value to your operation, because especially, you know, I'm just thinking with, with poinsettias that you're producing a lot of times in larger pots, um, the cost that you're going to put in as a preventative and to treat the, the, the young plants or, or, you know, sort of transplanted plants in production um, is going to, uh, far uh, outweigh any cost of uh, dump that you're going to have at the end on a, on a crop that's not saleable or, you know, the worst would be retail shrink. So, um, absolutely. And everybody, yep. you know, point point set is our, uh, our, an aesthetic crop. And uh, the last thing you want to do is see, uh, see finished product being dumped. So it's probably makes a lot of sense to put uh, 
some of the cost in early on to uh, to to ensure that crop stays high quality and uh, sells. You know, it it goes through at retail. So absolutely, um, yep. Yeah. So I really appreciate you sharing all these strategies. Um, I know that the listeners appreciate it, especially with uh, an important crop like poinsettias. So until next time, I'm Bill Calkins with Grower Talks and Green Profit. And on behalf of Aaron Palmatier and the folks at Bayer, we definitely want to wish you a successful poinsettia season. Absolutely. Thank you. Bayer Ornamentals recently released an excellent tool that'll no doubt be quite useful in your greenhouse. It's a user-friendly Spanish language pest ID guide. And I wanted to take a few minutes to talk to Bayer's senior technical service representative, Aaron Palmatier, about what's covered in the guide and how he sees it being used by greenhouse professionals across the United States. So Aaron, why don't we start with a quick overview of the Spanish Pest ID Guide and what growers can expect to find between the covers. All right, Bill. Um, yeah, first of all, the, the new Spanish Pest ID Guide from Bear can help cultivate stronger communication in greenhouse and, and nursery operations. Uh, the, the whole idea is for a user-friendly guide. It's easy to follow includes numerous pictures uh, to help Spanish speakers identify pests. Um, and the other thing is we've incorporated, you know, it, it, uh, some information on how to, to best use solutions from Bear. So we have some of our fungicide solutions, insecticide solutions, and, and herbicide solutions built into the guide. But it also includes information on what types of personal protection equipment should be worn when making these applications. Um, and one thing I will note also, uh, you mentioned in between the pages, but the guide is actually produced on a, on a really uh, high quality coated paper so that it's, it's gonna be nice for, you know, for having outside in the elements. Uh, and it's you know, bound together uh, to survive you know, wear and tear. Excellent. I, that's definitely always an issue uh, when you're working uh, in a greenhouse environment. And that's really cool that it includes all the photos um, that folks are going to need to ID these pests. So I think that that gives the listeners a pretty good overview. So one of my questions is, why did Bayer decide to develop a Spanish language pest ID guide? Um, because you guys are known for all of your resources. So why, you know, wh why did you guys decide to uh, launch this uh, Spanish uh, language guide to supplement all these resources. Sure, sure. You know, so one, you know, the ability to quickly identify and treat pests is an important part of, you know, of what we do in ornamentals for, for healthy plants. And so it's even easier if you have a guide that speaks the language of, of some of, of, you know, some of the, the workers that are in your facility. And so, you know, that's why Bear developed a new ID guide specifically for Spanish speaking growers and, and laborers. And again, this, this guide is, is not like real advanced. This is, this is very, you know, uh, I, I like to say fundamental, uh, but the, the, the key is you know, easy to use. The guide helps bridge communication gaps to ensure everyone knows how to properly identify pests. And then, and then of course, use our products properly and, and, and safely. Um, you know, we want to, at Bear, we want to continue expanding diversity and inclusion and bringing people together. So I think the, the new Spanish guy does that. Yeah. That's awesome. And, you know, it is really, uh, like you said, all about communication and bridging those communication gaps. So I think that, uh, that that's a really important point. Um, and the fact that uh, it talks about helping quickly identify, and I know that's one of uh, one of the things you always mention is that that diagnosis and how critical that is. So uh, that that's great, and this is going to be a really useful resource. Um, if listeners want to order a copy or multiple copies, how how are they going to access this guide? Sure. So it's actually it's going to be available, and it's starting. At, it's going to be sometime in you know the beginning of July. And they'll be able to go on to the, the Bear website, and it's really simple. It's just es dot bear b a y e r dot u s, and then if you do forward slash Spanish dash test dash identification dash guide, that that's a link that will uh, bring you right to a web page uh, to to access uh, to order the guides. 
and you know, go go ahead. I was going to say that's great. And we will actually put a link to that in the show notes so that folks can uh, quickly click on that link. Um, so that would be July 2020 availability. Um, and yeah, so all you need to do is look in the show notes uh, of this podcast and you'll see a, a quick link uh, to access this guide. So I, I appreciate that, Aaron. I, I definitely think growers are going to appreciate uh, the effort that Bayer put into this, and it's going to be a useful resource really for, for greenhouses of any uh, shape and size um, that has a, a Spanish-speaking workforce. This is going to be a, a great tool to have in the toolbox. So I appreciate uh, you letting us all know about that.